almost everything we do depends on energy. Getting to work in the morning, sitting in a nice climate-controlled building, cooking a meal, connecting to the internet, these things all consume energy. But we have been far too dependent on hydrocarbons to provide us with this energy. Materials such as coal, oil, and natural gas that took millions of years to form are burned to create steam and spin turbines that generate our electricity. In addition to the carbon emissions produced, these hydrocarbons are a finite resource, and we must use them wisely to preserve them for producing things like plastics, fibers, and solvents, materials we depend on every day. And not everyone has access to power. There are a billion people in our world today who do not have electricity. If they were to get power in the same way as most of us, the impact on the environment would be huge due to the overuse of fossil fuels. There is exciting work happening in areas such as nuclear fusion, which offers the promise of delivering clean, cheap, and unlimited power to everyone. But we already have free power from nuclear fusion, and it's available to everyone. The sun is a giant nuclear reactor, and it bathes our planet in energy, which can be harnessed directly by solar panels, converting light into electricity, or indirectly in the form of wind energy. Now, let me be clear. I don't think we should cover every single square inch of our planet with solar panels and wind turbines. And we will want to continue working on high energy density solutions, like nuclear fusion. But we can comfortably supply most of our current energy needs by capturing less than one-tenth of one percent of the solar energy that makes it to Earth. There's no excuse for continuing to dump enormous amounts of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere, and there's no excuse for leaving a billion people in the dark. The price of solar panels and wind turbines has plummeted in the last decade, making them already cost-competitive with fossil fuels. So why haven't we already done this? Why don't we see solar panels on every roof when we drive down the street? And why haven't we already moved to a 100% emission-free power system if these technologies are already cost-competitive with traditional methods of supplying power? Well, renewable energy sources don't provide a continuous supply of power. While they might be providing a lot of energy at noon, they're not providing you with energy when you need it in the evening. Wind energy is also not continuous. Just last week, across the central United States, strong output from wind turbines forced the price of electricity below negative $10 per megawatt hour. That means that the operators of those wind turbines had to pay money to put electricity back into the grid because there was too much supply and no way to store it. For it to be useful, we have to be able to store energy when and where we generate it, so that we can use it later on demand when we need it. Now, with traditional fuels, this is easy. You can put them in a barrel and then burn them later when you want to extract energy. But with solar and wind, it's electrons that are being generated. So how do you store an electron? Well, unfortunately, you can't just put them in a barrel. To store any substantial amount of energy, you have to first convert them into something else and then convert them back when you want the energy. This is a key barrier to the implementation of renewable energy sources because in this process of back and forth, energy is lost. One of the ways of storing energy is something that everyone here is probably familiar with and has in their pocket right now, a chemical battery. Chemical batteries work by using electricity to drive a chemical reaction. And that chemical reaction is reversed to give you power back when you need it. The problem is that this chemical reaction is not entirely reversible. So over time, the reaction produces byproducts, which partially block the reaction. And eventually, 
these byproducts prevent the battery from storing energy. Also, these batteries use some pretty harsh chemicals produced from harmful mining practices, and they're difficult to dispose of. But this is not the only technology for storing energy. There are many others. Pumped hydroelectric storage, for example, works by pumping water uphill into a reservoir to store energy. The water is then released downhill through a turbine to generate electricity. This requires the combination of a low altitude and a high altitude reservoir near each other in order for it to work. But it is the cheapest way of storing energy in those regions where it's available. Compressed air energy storage works by pumping air up to high pressure into a strong container. And hydrogen is another way of storing energy in which electricity is used to drive the splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen, a process which is currently not very efficient. The hydrogen is then separated from the oxygen and stored either in gas form or liquid form. And then it's burned or used to power a fuel cell. So these technologies all have their merits, but they also have their strong limitations, whether it's requiring specific geography, accepting low efficiency or high cost. These obstacles prevent their wide-scale implementation. If we want clean energy from renewables, we need a clean way to store the energy, reliably, efficiently, and at low cost. This is a challenge we must face, and it is urgent. Today, I want to tell you that a solution to this problem may lie in the reinvention of a technology which is over 100 years old, the harnessing of kinetic energy in the form of a flywheel. Kinetic energy is something that everyone in this audience is familiar with. When you accelerate onto the highway in your car, you're building up kinetic energy. But what you might not be familiar with is that it's also possible to store kinetic energy for periods of time as rotational energy. Just like your car takes some time to come to a stop if you don't apply the brakes, a flywheel will continue to spin for periods of time because of its inertia. The faster you spin the flywheel, the more energy you can store and the higher the inertia is. The idea is simple. An electric motor is used to accelerate a flywheel up to high speeds. When you want the energy back, you slow down the cylinder with a generator, converting kinetic energy back into electricity. Flywheels are robust, clean, and their energy storage capacity never dissipates. So you can store the same amount of energy after 50 years as you can on day one. They can tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions, including extreme cold and high temperatures. And because the components are completely inert, they cannot cause dangerous fires. And as we develop newer and stronger materials, we'll be able to spin flywheels up to higher speeds, storing more energy. But there's a catch. Flywheels are very inefficient. They lose energy rapidly due to friction as the flywheel spins. Newer systems use electromagnets to lift the flywheel to reduce friction, but those systems, those electromagnets still consume a lot of energy, limiting efficiency. So this seems like a great technology, but it can't store energy for that long, which is not that good for long duration energy storage. But if we could reduce these energy losses, we would have a technology that could propel the adoption of renewable energy sources. So is there a way for us to reduce these energy losses by an order of magnitude or more? A little clicker issue here. OK. Um, well, it turns out that there is. A material discovered in 1987 known as a high temperature superconductor. High temperature is, however, relative. They have to be cooled down to liquid nitrogen temperatures to work. But superconductors are remarkable. Once cooled below a specific temperature, they can conduct electricity with zero resistance. And they can do this because the electrons pair together to move through the material without any collisions. But they have another equally remarkable property, the ability to trap magnetic fields. This ability to trap magnetic fields 
allows for the stable levitation of an object without the need for control systems or electromagnets that consume a lot of power. Now, if the object is pushed away from its center position, it is moved back towards the center, just like a marble at the center of a bowl. Superconductors have a couple of challenges with their implementations. The first is that they have to be cooled down to low temperatures, which has traditionally required either liquid nitrogen or bulky compressors. And the second is that they've been traditionally difficult to manufacture. But in the last several years, there have been dramatic improvements in the cost and manufacturing process of superconducting materials, driven largely by the demand from a few nuclear fusion startup companies that will require low-cost superconducting magnets. Cryocooler technology has also improved. So what once used to require a large bulky compressor can now be done with a smaller cryogen-free system. We are working on the development of a highly efficient flywheel energy storage system based on an improved high-temperature superconducting magnetic bearing system. Our design reduces the amount of superconducting material required so we can create a system that can sustain the required temperatures with just a small, low-power cooling system that uses less power than the average light bulb. In addition, in case of a cooling system failure, the superconducting material will take several hours to warm up, giving the flywheel plenty of time to come to a complete stop, making this technology inherently safe against cooling system or control system failures. This technology will allow us to match the high efficiency of lithium-ion batteries while extending the lifespan by up to 10 times, thereby dramatically reducing the cost, which is a key barrier to the implementation of utility-scale energy storage and therefore renewable power. So what would a world with clean, cheap energy storage look like? Well, I think it might look something like this. Neighborhoods reliably powered by clean power sources. Secure power at all times, immune to large-scale power outages, available at low cost to a large percentage of the population. Low-cost scalable energy storage would improve grid security by decentralizing it. But it would also look like this. Local microgrids in developing countries allowing power access in rural areas where the cost of bringing in new power lines and the associated infrastructure is just too high. Regions that had never before been connected to the grid would have reliable access to power day and night. And this would enable transformative impacts in far-reaching areas such as healthcare services and education. We should remember that the Earth is not, not the only place in our solar system with access to solar power. This blue Martian sunset reminds us of that. So as we set our eyes to the stars and begin manned exploration of our solar system led by NASA and the emerging private space industry, we should remember that we can harness the power of the sun if we have a way to store it. Thank you.